again. So we're continuing our series, Coffee Mug Christianity. And we've been looking at verses that we put on a coffee mug or that we put on a t-shirt. And we look at this and we, you know, we've seen athletes put the scripture under their eyes or even to the fact that you see, you know, behind the goalpost, John 3.16, where you see behind hockey goals, or wherever it is, you, you see all of this inside the crowds. And I think the problem is that we, we tend to shape Scripture around our own lives instead of letting our lives be shaped by the Scripture. See, we, 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 we get so caught up with, we want this to fit our agenda. Man, I really like this verse because it makes me feel good. And instead of me saying, hey, I like this verse because it makes me feel good, I should take that verse and say, man, this verse really transformed my life. Amen. This changed the trajectory of my life, and it's just not something to go on a coffee cup. It's not something to go on top of a t-shirt. You know, and, and I think, unfortunately, what happens is because we all have our, these verses or, you know, that make us feel good, that we consider, continue that cliche of it's just words and it's just on a coffee mug or a t-shirt or a bumper sticker and it's not really transforming our lives. It doesn't change us from the inside out. And today's scripture I think is a piece of, is a piece of scripture that definitely gets taken out of context all the time. It is taken out of context probably more than any other scripture verse I can think of. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open up to Jeremiah 29. Open up to Jeremiah 29. Now the main verse I'm going to be preaching on is verse 11. Jeremiah 29, 11, which most of us in our mind are probably going, man, I know that verse. I don't need my Bible for that. Well, we're going to be reading more than just Jeremiah 29, 11 as the sermon goes on, but we're going to start with just a verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, which says this, for I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration, plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Amen, right? We all like that verse. And in a lot of your, in a lot of this um, versions, it probably says to prosper, plans to prosper you, and to give you a hope and a future. And I want to apologize to you real quick. If this is your life verse, I'm going to ruin your life verse. I'm just letting you know straight out from the get go. If this is your life verse, I'm going to ruin it for you, and I'm sorry. But I want to apologize up front. But one of the things that I say is we always got to look at the context, not just a piece of Scripture. We've got to look at the whole piece of Scripture and what it says. And we see this verse used in the world today. Think about it. Most graduation ceremonies, whether it's high school or college, you see this verse. You have, there's plans for your future. You have a hope, you have a future, you have all of this going forward. And we see that at all these different events. People who are hurting for money, man, I need to pay my bills. I'll just read 29, Jeremiah 29, 11. It says it'll prosper me. I'll just name it and claim it. Jeremiah 29, 11. It's a promise of God, so if I read it, I'll be able to pay my bills. Now, don't get me wrong. I've got no problem with someone using this verse to give someone hope. Because Lord knows we need hope nowadays, don't we? This world definitely needs some hope. And there's nothing wrong with using this verse to give someone some hope. But we got to keep it in the context of what it is. You know, and... and we need to understand that this isn't just telling us that God's going to make everything okay. He's not going, he's, this verse doesn't tell us it's going to be okay. And, and, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of times, if you're like me, or maybe it's just me, you know, we kind of pick and choose the verses in the Bible we want to read. 
You know, there's verses in the Bible none of us want to read. But there's verses that we'll go to. Oh, man, I like this verse. It makes me feel good. And we'll pick them feel-good verses. And then what do we do? We put them on a coffee cup or we post them on social media, you know, because we feel good about this certain verse. And, and, and most of the verses that we pick, have you ever noticed they're about God's blessings or promises? Because we want to feel good about it. We want to, it's not just me, is it? I just want to check if it's me, I'll stop talking now. It's not me. Okay, just check it, you know. But, but we try and pick and choose verses instead of taking everything. And we pick and choose the parts that we like. And a lot of people use Jeremiah 29, 11. And, and I happen to really like the verse. It does provide hope. But we got to understand when the hope is coming when you actually look at this verse. You know, and I think a lot of us struggle with this idea of just being able to choose a piece of scripture instead of looking at it in the context um, just to feel better about ourselves. And it's interesting, I was reading in a, a lady, her name's Catherine McNeil, she's an author, and, and she writes about society and Christians, um, how they really, we got to have these life verses. We, we've got to, we're just in love with life verses and different pieces of scripture. And, and the trouble that we create as we cling to these verses, and when we cling to this verse and, and then we take it out of context and we put it on top of our coffee mugs or we put it on a t-shirt or we hang it on the wall in our office, you know, and, and she actually compares the relationship between social media and our favorite Bible verses. Because if you think about this, when you look at social media, what do you see? You see the best of a person's life, right? You see everyone's always happy. Everything's always, it looks so good. And they're like, man, I wish I could be on vacation like they are all the time. But what it's doing is it's taken out of context. And we end up looking at that and we're in our mon mundane, messy life that we're going through. And we're like, how come they got this and I didn't? Well, how, how come God's blessing them and not blessing me? And because what we do is we take it out of context, and that's exactly what she says. We tend to take it out of context, and that promises in the Bible, like social media, need to be considered in their full context, that full messiness of reality. And she goes on and she writes this. Somehow many of us believe that utmost success and ease are due us, as our life verses seem to promise. So when the reality of life hits, it feels as though God has done something wrong. We're clutching these hopeful Bible verses and browsing page after page of our friends' bright and cheerful social media posts. But, we're, but we've never considered the context of any of them. God's faithfulness to Israel takes place over thousands of years of slavery, exile, and oppression. And that requires a long, long surrender before the promise. God's redemption of creation is still pending completion. And I think we forget that. And she really hits this on the head. And so when we take Jeremiah 29, 11 out of context, we believe that God will only allow good things to happen to us. That's a good feeling, right? He's only going, only good things. It's going to be puppies and unicorns and rainbows. It's going to be a beautiful life. But looking at the actual context of this, it reveals that it's a promise of delayed relief. It's not coming right now. It's going to be a delayed relief, and they need to continue to prosper in their suffering. So while they're suffering, that promise isn't going to come. You know, and, and when we take it at face value, when you actually look at the different versions of the Bible that we have now, and even if you look back at the original Hebrew, it, 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 it's a good translation. It makes perfect sense. And, and basically, it's the words communicate God's purpose for his people. So it is saying this is the purpose for my people. Um, but who's he talking to? Who's the prophet talking to during this time? And who's God trying to speak this to? And I think when we expand on just Jeremiah 29, 11, and we go ahead and read the verses that are around it, we're going to get the context of what Jeremiah 29, 11 is really saying. 
So like I said, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in Jeremiah 29, and I'm going to start reading in verse 4. We're going to read verses 4 through 11, and it says this. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on his behalf, for when it thrives, you will thrive. For this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Don't let your prophets who are among you and your diviners deceive you, and don't listen to the dreams you elicit from them, for they are, they are prophesying falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. This is the Lord's declaration. For this is what the Lord says. When 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now that takes it a whole different ballgame now, doesn't it? It's just not, hey, I'm here to prosper you. It's not about that we're going to feel good. They've been stripped of everything. The Israelites from the Judah has been stripped of their entire livelihood. They're taken into exile, thrown into exile. And in other words, their calamity is it's crazy. Can you imagine today being taken into exile? None of us can probably imagine that because you think about it, it probably would never happen to us. They were removed from their homeland, removed from the promised land, flowing with milk and honey, and taken to Babylon. And I think it's interesting that the future that God speaks of, that hope and that peace, isn't coming for 70 years. Is not coming for 70 years. In other words, most of them who hear this are never going to see the promise. They're in Babylon. He says, after 70 years, anyone most of our ages, guess what? Never sees this promise. Never sees this promise of God. And some of their children are either not going to see it or they're going to be too old. So guess what it's going to be? It's going to be the future generations that see this. And in reference to Jeremiah's letter, the period of 70 years, I think it actually refers to a lifetime you know, a person's lifetime, and none of those in Babylon could have this hope for this future because they weren't going to see it. They were not going to see it at all. And Jeremiah's message, as it was originally given, was quite evident. It was meant to dampen or premature that, well, we serve a God who's going to bring us out of this captivity. He's going to bring you out of it, but these letting them know, Jeremiah say, hey, you're going to be here 70 years first. You're going to be here 70 years before I take you out of this. And so many times we'll look at that verse and be like, God's going to prosper me. I need rent money on the first. God prosper me. Israel, the Israelite nation had to wait 70 years for that promise. Some of us ain't waited five minutes and we're Reading this promise, expecting it now. Thinking God's this vending machine or a genie. You get three wishes, open the Bible, here's wish number one. But that's not how it works. I think it's interesting, they were to build upon this painful, ex on this painful experience and this reality of Babylon, they had to build on it because that was going to be their present future for a while. And consequently, they had to adapt to that situation. They had to adapt to the situation. They had to learn to thrive where they were planted. They had to learn to be where they were. So I think when we consider ver the verses surrounding, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11 is coffee mug verse. And like I said, if it's your life verse, I'm sorry. <laughs> we see that God is not promising an immediate end to suffering for his people. 
He's not promising it's going to end now. But he asks them to dig in. He tells them to dig in where they're at. Build houses. Plant gardens. Take husbands and wives. Thrive where you're at so when the city thrives, you will what? Thrive. So in the midst of the struggle, God tells them they need to dig in. They need to dig in. They need to move forward. And he tells them to build their future then and even to pray in the blessing upon the people who have them in captivity. Think about that. Those people who have them in bondage, God's telling them you need to pray for them people. Talk about praying for your enemies. That's exactly what they're told to do. And then it's told in 70 years, you're going to deal with this for 70 years, but in 70 years, I'm going to give you hope. I'm going, I know what your hope and your future is. But you need to endure and you need to dig in where you're at. Jeremiah 29, 11 is not a verse saying that God's going to be on your side. It's not going to always be on your side. He's not saying that, that, he, uh, that we'll be able to do anything we want because of God's promise. It's a promise of God, so I can do it. Too many people live life like that. And that's not what it says. That is not what Jeremiah 29, 11 is saying. And unfortunately, what tends to happen is we start believing that God uh, is going to allow only good things in the, into our life. We start thinking, well, if we, if we name it and claim it, what happens is you lose hope. And you might think, well, wait a minute, if I'm naming it and claiming it and I'm praying these promises of God, I should have hope. Well, no, actually, you're not going to have hope because what's going to happen is life is going to happen. And that ugliness that we deal with each and every day in life, the bosses that we don't like, the mixed door neighbors that we don't like, family members we might not even like, they get in the way. And then all of a sudden now we lose hope because like, well, wait a minute, God, your word said this and this is happening to me. And we tend to lose that hope. And we tend to start thinking, well, God, where are you in my mess? He's telling you, you got to be right there with it. Plant yourself. Where you're planted, you need to thrive. And we get so caught up. And, and I think we lose hope sometimes when we get older. We kind of look around. And you're like, man, where am I? This isn't where I thought I was going to be. I didn't think I'd be doing this. I didn't think I'd have these people around me. And you look around and you, you, the life that you have, you realize isn't the life that you planned. I remember when I was a kid, I didn't plan this life to be like this. No one told me life was going to be hard. No one told me it was going to be messy. But here I am right in the thick of it, knee deep, stuck in this mess of a life. And maybe you just feel like maybe you're in exile right now. Maybe you feel like you're having this Babylon experience in your life. And you think you have this chain that's just holding you down. I can't move. I'm chained to this experience. I can't break this chain. I heard a story this week that totally blew my mind. When an elephant is kept in captivity, they put a chain and a collar around its leg. So as that elephant walks, it gets to the point where it feels tension and it no longer walks forward. So it ends up backing up. Now, over time, and as this elephant grows, it's so used to every time it takes a step and it feels tension, it stops and it backs up. So actually what they do is as the elephant grows bigger and bigger, they will actually just use a piece of twine around the elephant's leg. Because it has become so accustomed to when it feels pressure, it stops and backs up. It could easily break that piece of twine, but it stops because it feels pressure. I think some of us are kind of like an elephant. We feel a little bit of pressure in our life and we stop and we refuse to move forward because we've been so stuck to, well, when I feel pressure, I got to stop. I can't keep going. Some of us need to break that twine because that's exactly what it is, is a piece of twine holding us back. 
We need to continue to move forward. And, and you think about, go back and let's read verses five and seven again. And what does it say? It says, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourself and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for when it thrives, you will thrive. But what do we do in moments of pressure? We look around and we just, man, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe what's happened to me. And then we lose hope. And then we lose hope. And you got choices. You can lose hope or you can break that piece of twine that's holding you back. Break that piece of twine holding you back. And you can then, then turn to verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, And you can start to realize that God's asking you to trust him. Trust him where you're at. Trust him inside your mess. Trust him in the hard times. It's so easy to trust him in the good ones. We can trust God when everything's going good. But when times are hard, we need to trust him. We need to lean in. We need to not decrease. Right where he's planted us, wherever he's deported us to, wherever we're at at that time, we need to thrive because when we thrive and the city thrives, everything's going to be better. But so many of us just feel the pressure when we back off and we step back. Oh, woe's me. Oh, woe's me. But we got to understand that God's calling us to trust him. And when that smoke clears of all that messiness, that's what he's asking you to do. To trust him. To trust him through the process. You see, when we read promises out of context, we believe God has failed us when life doesn't turn out the way his promise calls for and we lose that hope. However, when we look at it in the context, you know, we can see that God's faithfulness transcends out of our suffering. It is going to transcend through our suffering and we realize that we can persevere through suffering. We can make it. Every one of us has a story of when we suffered and we've made it through. Now, it doesn't mean there's not going to be more suffering, but every one of us can look back and say, hey, I remember when I was there and God showed up in my life. And I was able to look to verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, and it gave me a hope in the future, even though I knew it was going to be down the road. It wasn't going to be immediate. It wasn't like I was going to a vending machine and here's my hope for the day. Because that's not how it works. And it's not how it works for the Israelite nation. You know, you may find yourself in the midst of Babylon right now. Looking around your life and you realize it's not the way you planned it. Not the way you planned it. And maybe you're in a job that you just absolutely hate. And unfortunately, you're in a job that you hate, but you've spent most of your adult life training either in or doing that job just to hate it. And a lot of times it's not the job that you hate, it's the pressure that comes with the job. And you feel like you got this chain around you and it's really a piece of twine, you just need to break it and move forward. You know, maybe you feel like a failure in your marriage or as a parent. And you're like, I just totally messed up. And you feel like this world is closing in around you. Good news is God has a plan. God has a plan. He's still on the throne. And it's his plan, not yours. And that's where we mess up. We want our plan instead of his plan. I want it now. And how many of us are like that? We live in a society today where you can go online and get anything just like that. I can order from Amazon this morning and have it this afternoon. And don't have to go in a store and get road rage while pushing a shopping cart. We want everything now. We're in this now culture. But sometimes we've got to wait. And we've got to endure through the suffering to get to where God wants us to be. 
His plan calls for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Amen to that. It don't mean it's going to be now. Most of the Israelites never saw this promise. Never saw this promise. They had to endure through life, through the pain, through the suffering, but thrive right where they were at. And you're not alone when you feel like you're going through it. We know throughout history, throughout the Bible, you look at it, the Israelites suffered a lot. They were in captivity, out of captivity, back in the promised land, back into captivity. People constantly, even today, people still want to blow up Israel. They're still fighting for their life today, for the land that God promised them. And we get upset because we get a little bit of pressure. We've got to continue to move forward. Remember, we, we, we can't control what other people might say. We can't control what other people might do. We can't control all the things that may happen to us. Some of them are our own fault, but we can't control everything. What we can control is how we look to our future. We can control our future, and, and, and we can control how we respond to the trouble that we're in. We can control what we do in our mess. We can either go from knee deep to waist deep, or we can start breaking our way and moving forward to get out of that mess. And maybe just like God told the Israelites, don't wait around for God to work because it ain't coming anytime soon. But what we need to be is found faithful to God in the process. We need to be faithful to him that he's going to work it. And we may not see the fruits in our lifetime. Our children may see the fruits of what we did in our mess. And praise God for that. We may never see it. We may never see that fruit. So instead of being found faithful to God, we need to be, we need to be found faithful to God in the meantime. And it's interesting because if you read the, the verses after Jeremiah 29, 11, verses 12 through 14 actually say this. You will call to me and come to pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore you to the place from which I deported you. In the midst of our mess, in the midst of our exile, they're given a promise of a future and a hope. And we're given the same promise today, that future and a hope. We can call on God and he'll hear us. We can call on God and he will hear us. He will hear our cry. As Psalm 32 says, I've heard your cry and I will heal you. Those are promises that we need to take. But understand it may not happen like that. We may have to wait. We may have to trudge through the messiness and eventually break that twine that we think is a chain to continue to move forward. And knowing God's going to be with us every step of the way. James 4, 8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. God can restore every one of us. He can restore us to that place that he promises. And at some time, God will gather your life in and he'll bring you back to that place where, he, where you've always been meant to be. And that place you've always been meant to be is to be with him. We get so caught up where the place we thought we were going to be was here, here, here. And he just wants us to be with him. And know that drawing near to him, he will draw near to you. So the question is, are you willing to place your hope in God when his view of welfare in the future may not be seen in your lifetime? May not be seen in your lifetime. You may never see the fruits. Maybe your kids, maybe your grandkids. 
but we need to thrive in the mess. So let us continue to use this verse to claim God's goodness because that's exactly what it is. It's claiming his goodness. It's claiming his promise for the future, not necessarily the present. And we need to hold on to that promise. And when we read this verse out of context, we believe that God's failed us when life proves to be hard. And boy, life gets hard, doesn't it? But when we read it in context, we definitely realize that God's faithfulness transcends our suffering and that we can persevere through the suffering in our lives. And you know, maybe just your life's been so crazy that maybe you need to hear this today. Jeremiah 29, 11 is not about prosper. It's about a future hope. And one of the future hopes that each one of us has is as Christ followers that we get to be with Jesus for eternity. And if someone here has never met Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, it's pretty, I say it's simple. It's easy to step in, but it's hard to maintain. Because boy, there's going to be some troubles. Life out there does not change. We change. And if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and you're waiting to get it all right, understand that we're all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. All of us, including me. But God's word says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And from that point, you are now part of the kingdom. You're one of God's chosen people. You're in the family. It's a jacked up and messed up family. I'm in it. So it's messed up. But that's okay. We'll be messed up together. We'll be messed up together as we walk through this life, seeking him first. Draw near to God as he draws near to us. And knowing that in our mess, he's still there. And there is a future hope. It's not necessarily going to be today. But we can hold on to that hope for the future and continue to move forward in what he's called us to do. Thrive in your mess. Persevere through your pain and your suffering. Because God is bigger than it. And maybe you're here today and you're just like, you know, I just need to stop using verses as a go-to of, well, this is my favorite verse because it makes me feel good. Now, there's nothing wrong with a Bible verse making you feel good, but are you taking it out of context to make yourself feel good? Are you taking it out of context and then you get upset because all of a sudden I prayed this promise and it didn't come true? God must not love me. Am I really saved? What sin is in my life? And we get caught up with all of this stuff. And maybe it's just a matter of coming up and saying, Lord, I'm going to trust you in my mess. I'm going to trust you right where I am. And I'm going to thrive right where I am to get to the future that you want me to have. And maybe you just need to come up and pray and give it back to God. Or maybe there's just something bothering you and you're like, Pastor, I need to talk. I'll be off to the side. You can come and I'll pray with you. I'll talk with you about it before I come back up to close the service. Don't know what it is, but you do. So during this final time, if you want to come up and you want to pray, you need to accept Jesus, I'll be off to the side. You just need me to pray for you, I'll be off to the side. Make the move. Break the piece of twine that's holding you back. It's not a chain. Just because you feel pressure doesn't mean you got to stop. Keep moving forward for Jesus. Amen? Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we thank you. We thank you for verses that provide us with hope, that provide us with the future, Lord. 
Even though we may not see that future in our lifetime, we still thank you for your gratefulness. We thank you for your love, your kindness, the peace and everything that you provide for us. And Lord, may we open our eyes and may we move forward knowing that you still have a plan for us. We've got to go through the mess and we may have to thrive in the mess for a long time. But we know there is a future and a hope for us, Lord. And we know we can continue to draw near to you. Lord, I ask that you continue to be with us today. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.